Hi, my name is Maple. I'm on the program committee this year. It's nice to meet all of you. Um, so I used to work in Ruby internals, and so I recognize uh, the name of this man. <laughs> and when I saw that the opportunity to uh, introduce him came up, I immediately put my name down. Um, anyway, so next up, we have Jeremy Evans. Uh, Jeremy Evans is a Ruby committer who focuses on fixing bugs in Ruby. He is the lead developer of the SQL database library, the Rhoda Web Toolkit, and many other Ruby libraries. He is also the author of Polish Ruby Programming. And we have two copies here, uh, and you can come grab them after the talk. I got mine, and I got mine signed, so yeah. Give it up for Jeremy. All right, hello everyone. In this presentation, I'll be discussing what was Ruby's second oldest open bug and how we fixed the bug in Ruby 3.3. My name is Jeremy Evans. I am a Ruby committer who focuses on fixing bugs in Ruby. I'm also the author of Polished Ruby Programming, which was published a couple years ago. This book is aimed at intermediate Ruby programmers and focuses on teaching principles of Ruby programming, as well as trade-offs to consider when making implementation decisions. So what is the second oldest bug that I am discussing? I'm referring to bug 4040, which has the subject system stack error with hash star a for large a. And the reproduction code given in the bug report was this simple Ruby code. This calls the array reference method on hash with a splat of a very large array with over a million entries. And it turns out that this bug is not specific to that hash method. At the time that this bug was reported, this issue applied to any method when called with a splatted array if the number of elements in the array was large enough. You could reproduce the bug when calling the kernel puts method. You could reproduce the bug when calling a method defined in Ruby. You could even reproduce the bug with a method that does not accept any arguments, such as the kernel object ID method. And that's because the error occurs while setting up the arguments for the method call before actually calling the method. So Ruby's behavior when passing a very large array splat to a method has changed over time. Back in Ruby 1.8, passing too many arguments to a method would result in the Ruby interpreter crashing and dumping core, both for methods defined in C and for methods defined in Ruby. Now in Ruby 1.9, this condition was recognized, and a system stack error was raised instead for both cases. Ruby 2.0 and 2.1 had the same behavior as Ruby 1.9. Now in Ruby 2.2, Koichi Sasada, the author of the Ruby Virtual Machine, fixed this issue for methods defined in Ruby that accept splats. And that same behavior remains in Ruby 3.2. Now, as you can probably guess from this presentation, we fixed this issue in Ruby 3.3. So now calling the object ID method with a large array splat correctly results in an argument error. And if you switch to the example code given in the original bug report, you can see that it works correctly and returns a hash with a single entry. Now, some of you may be thinking, who cares about this issue, right? I mean, surely nobody is splatting such a large array, right? But do any of you have code in your applications that does something like this, where you splat a variable when calling the method? I'm assuming most of us do. Any chance you have code somewhere in one of your applications that accepts user input and assigns it to a variable? Again, probably most of us have code like this. Now, any chance you have that variable with user input that is later splatted? Now, this becomes less likely, but I'm guessing at least a small percentage of the audience has code somewhere that splats user input. And if so, you need to recognize that this probably allows a user to remotely trigger a system stack error. So let's say you know your application deals with user input and you want to handle unexpected errors using rescue. Unfortunately, this does not work the way you expect. If the call to some method raises a system stack error, cleanup method will not be called. And that's because this rescue does not catch system stack error. Rescue without an argument is the same as rescue standard error, 
And system stack error is a subclass of exception, not a subclass of standard error. So let's say you expect some method to raise non-standard error exceptions, and you want to do some cleanup using a couple of methods, and then re-raise the exception. So what's the problem here? Well, the problem is that cleanup method also raises a system stack error, which means that other cleanup method will never be called. Now, hopefully these examples were helpful in demonstrating that this issue may exist in your own code and it may be triggerable remotely. So I'm now going to discuss details about why this bug occurred. Now I'm going to focus on how arguments were handled for methods defined in C and Ruby 3.2 which will generally apply to earlier Ruby versions as well. So for background, I will first discuss how methods are defined using Ruby's C API. So here's an example of how kernel itself is defined in Ruby. So this part is the C function for the method, and this part is how the C function is registered as a method in Ruby. So kernel itself does not take any arguments. So you pass zero as the number of arguments when you're registering the method, and since the Ruby method does not accept any arguments, the C function is called with a single argument, which is the receiver of the method. Now value here is the C type used for all Ruby objects, and both the C function argument and the C function return value must be Ruby objects. Now to start work on fixing this bug, I need to define where is this bug occurring? And one of the tools I use most when I'm starting out debugging is grep or git grep. Another of the tools I use frequently when debugging C code is GDB, the GNU debugger. So to get a general idea for how method calling works, we run Ruby through GDB and we tell Ruby to execute the itself method. And then we set a breakpoint on the underlying C function that will be called. So if you're building Ruby with support for the shared library, most of Ruby is contained in a libruby shared object and not in the Ruby binary itself. So you have to tell GDB that you want this breakpoint to be pending a shared library load. Then GDB sets the pending breakpoint and then you can tell GDB to run the Ruby program. And GDB runs Ruby until it hits that breakpoint. And at that point, you can use the GDB backtrace command to see how did I get here. Um, and then this should show generally how Ruby calls methods defined in C. So here's the simplified backtrace output. And we can split this backtrace into four basic sections. So the bottom section is basically everything that Ruby runs before calling the itself method. This section is generic method calling code, regardless of how the method was defined. This section is code specific to calling methods defined in C. And at the very top, we have code specific to the itself method. And since this bug occurs when calling methods defined in C, it seems likely that the problem is in one of these three functions, or in one of the functions that they call. And while this is helpful, it would be best if we could see exactly where this system stack error is being raised. We can start that process by grepping to see where system stack error is defined. And it's always nice when you only get a single result back. From this line, we can see that the system stack error Ruby class is stored in a C global variable named RBE sysstack error. And if you grep for that, you do get a bunch of results, but I'm going to filter them out for simplicity. Now the stack level two deep string here gives a pretty good indication that we're on the right track. Now here we see a call to RBVM register special exception. Now I do not know what this function does, but based on the name, probably registers an exception. Since we know that RBE sysstack error is a reference to system stack error, we can probably assume that the first argument is being registered with it. And if we grep for Ruby error sysstack, we only get four results, one of which we can ignore, as it's the same as the previous grep. Now this line seems interesting. What if we go to that file and look at that line? And here's the code around that line. And there's one large indication that this is what we are looking for, and that's the function name, which contains the words stack overflow. So it looks like this is the function that's called if the stack would overflow, so you, that you can raise a system stack error instead of the program crashing. And we can use GDB to see, is that correct? In this case, we're going to pass code that should trigger the stack overflow, 
And then we're going to set a breakpoint on the EC stack overflow function and then run the program. And thankfully we guessed correctly and the breakpoint is hit. We can use the backtrace command to see how do we get there. And most of the backtrace is the same as the previous one. So I've highlighted the new lines. Now these top two lines are both for functions with stack overflow in the name. So these are likely called when a potential stack overflow has been detected and not the cause of the stack overflow. The function directly before those lines, named VM caller setup arg splat, is the probable cause. And here is the definition of that function. It determines which object is being splatted, and if the object being splatted is not nil, we assume it is an array, we then determine the length of the array to splat. And in the normal case, we copy all objects from the splatted array to the VM stack. Well, some of you are probably wondering, what is the VM stack? So the VM stack here refers to the stack used by Ruby's virtual machine. Virtual machines are generally either stack-based or register-based, and Ruby's virtual machine is stack-based. So Ruby's compiler compiles your Ruby code into virtual machine instructions, which operate on this stack and values on the VM stack are Ruby objects. Now to understand the underlying system stack error issue, at this point I think it would be a little helpful for me to explain sort of how things are laid out in memory. And this explanation will be oversimplified, brief, and at least partly wrong, but I am hoping it at least helps uh, some people. So you can consider memory as continuous storage from the lowest memory address, represented here by all zeros, to the highest memory address, represented here by all Fs. And Ruby is written in C, and while C does not use a virtual machine, C uses a stack to store stack frames. There is generally one stack frame per C function call, and the stack frame holds the memory locations for the local variables for that C function call. When C needs to store data that is not stored on the stack, it first needs to allocate memory from the operating system, which is often done using the malloc function. And the section of memory where these allocations are located is often referred to as the heap. So Ruby uses malloc and other functions to allocate most of the memory it uses. So most of Ruby's memory usage is on the C heap. One of the things that Ruby stores on the C heap is the object pool. This is where Ruby objects are stored in memory. And for large objects, sometimes they don't fit in memory and they're stored, the excess data is stored elsewhere on the C heap. Another of the things that Ruby stores here is the stack for Ruby's virtual machine. And this is what the presentation refers to as the VM stack. And this is where Ruby stores stack frames for Ruby method calls and where it temporarily stores objects that are passed as arguments to those methods. If you try to pass too many arguments to a method call or you have unbounded recursion, your program would try to write beyond the end of Ruby's VM stack. And since Ruby 1.9, Ruby recognizes when you're about to do this and raises a system stack error instead of having the program crash, as I discussed earlier. In this presentation, I discuss VM stack as if it were a single place in memory. But in truth, Ruby can have multiple VM stacks. The main thread has the main VM stack, but each additional thread you create has its own thread stack. And VM stacks for additional threads are generally smaller than for the main thread. Additionally, each fiber you create has its own fiber stack, and fiber stacks are generally smaller than thread stacks. One reason that Ruby does not scale well to huge numbers of fibers is the garbage collection time for scanning these fiber stacks. Now in this presentation, the term VM stack refers to the stack used by the currently executing Ruby code, which could be the main VM stack, or it could be one of these separate thread or fiber stacks. If we go back to the initial example, we saw that we needed over a million arguments to trigger this issue, and that's because this uses the main VM stack. You only need about 132,000 arguments to trigger this issue in a thread stack. And one thing to be aware of is that the majority of request handling in Ruby web applications is gonna be on a thread stack and not on the main VM stack. If your Ruby web application accepts JSON input, and we'll splat the result of JSON input, triggering a system stack error remotely may be possible with less than 300 kilobytes uploaded. If you run your Ruby web application using a fiber per request, like in Falcon, 
It may take only 16,400 arguments to trigger a system stack error. And if you tune your Ruby web application to decrease the stack size per fiber or thread for better garbage collection performance or for reduced memory usage, triggering a system stack error may be possible with just over 2,000 arguments. With that background, let's get back to our example. So to refresh, we discussed this section, which copies all of the objects from the splatted array to the VM stack. After this, we increase the number of our arguments the method is called with, with the length of the splatted array, subtracting one for the array itself. However, before doing any of this copying, we check whether copying all of the arguments from the splatted array to the VM stack would overflow the stack, so that a system stack error can be raised instead of the program crashing. And this is the check that's being hit when you're splatting a large array. Now, unfortunately, there is no way to avoid this issue as long as you take the approach of copying the arguments to the VM stack. The only way to avoid this approach would be to not pass the arguments on the stack. If we go back to the initial backtrace when calling itself without any arguments, we see the function calling RB object itself is named Raptor Safe Call C Funk Zero. And the prototype for that function looks like this. It takes the receiver of the Ruby method, it takes the number of arguments the method is called with, it takes a pointer to the first argument for the method, and a function pointer for the C function to call uh, that implements the Ruby method. So taking a step up, the function calling Raptor Safe Call C Funk Zero is named VM Call C Funk with Frame. And that function is large, so I'm going to focus on the line calling Raptor Safe Call C Funk Zero. And you can't really tell that it's calling Raptor Safe Call C Funk Zero because that's actually stored in an invoker function pointer. The important part here is the value that it is passing as a pointer to the first argument. In this case, it's always passing a pointer to the VM stack, and the VM stack is quite limited in size. If we could change this call to pass a pointer to somewhere else in memory, calling a method defined in C with a large array splat should work. So we can start that process back in the VM caller setup arg splat function. Let's reduce the code to focus on the case where there is an array to splat. If some condition is true, we should use an approach that does not copy arguments to the VM stack. And one simple condition is if the number of arguments being passed to the method plus the length of the splatted array is over some high number, say 1,000, then do not use the VM stack for argument passing. Now, how should you pass the arguments if you're not going to pass them on the VM stack? One of the easiest ways to do this is to create a temporary Ruby array for the arguments, and then instead of passing a pointer to the stack, you pass a pointer to the first element of that temporary array. So here's the code that implements that approach. We start off by creating a Ruby array with the expected capacity. We then hide the array, and this makes sure that the array is not accessible via object space. We copy the method arguments before the splatted array to the temporary array. We then copy the elements of the splatted array to the temporary array. We still pass a pointer to the temporary array of arguments on the VM stack. So we need to adjust SP, the stack pointer, to reflect that. And since there is only one argument on the VM stack, we adjust the calling information to only show one argument. And this is correct from a stack perspective, but it is incorrect from a method calling perspective. And finally, we set a new flag in the calling information named heapargv to flag that the arguments are being passed on the heap in a temporary array instead of on the VM stack. Now, some of you may be wondering, how does the code that copies the arguments before the splat and the splat itself handle any arguments after the splat? And it turns out you don't need to worry about that because Ruby's compiler implicitly converts methods calls like this with arguments after the splat into a single array that is then splatted. So the method argument handler does not need to worry about arguments after the splat. But if you're splatting multiple arrays like this, well, similarly, Ruby combines them both into a single array that is then splatted. So the method argument handler does not need to worry about multiple splats. However, what about keyword arguments? Either literal keyword arguments or keyword argument splat. Turns out this is actually a single case, since Ruby's compiler compiles a literal keyword argument after an argument splat, and is creating a new hash and then keyword splatting that hash. 
Now in Ruby 3.2, for all of these calls, the compiler will actually combine the argument splat and the keywords into a single array that's splatted and then set a special flag. Now in Ruby 3.3, Koichi changed the compiler to not combine the keywords into the argument splat, which avoided three unnecessary array allocations and an unnecessary hash allocation. However, that means that the code in Ruby 3.3 does need to handle keyword argument splats to get correct behavior. So to make sure the keyword splat is passed properly when using a temporary array to hold the arguments, after the call to VM call or setup arg splat, we push the keyword hash onto the array, but only if the keyword hash is not empty, because empty keyword hashes are ignored. All right, back to the function for calling methods defined in C. Now that we have set up the temporary array for arguments on the heap, we need to make changes to use the pointer to the first element of that array, instead of using a pointer to the VM stack. We need to recognize when to use the temporary array for arguments, which we can do by checking for that heap argv flag. So here's the code for using the temporary array for arguments. We get a pointer to the temporary array containing the arguments. From there, we get a pointer to the first element of the temporary array. Now that pointer points to the heap, does not point to the VM stack. We use the length of the temporary array as the number of method arguments, and then finally we call the C function using the correct number of arguments and a pointer to the first element of the temporary array. And while the changes I went over are the most important changes, there were a few changes needed in other functions, mostly to check if this heap argv flag is set and to handle things differently in that case. I don't have time to discuss all the other places that needed to be changed, but it required adding about five different checks for this heap argv flag. After making those changes, it did not take much more work to get Ruby's test suite passing with the changes. Unfortunately, while the test passed, there was a minor slowdown uh, resulting. So the additional checks slowed down method calling microbenchmarks by up to 7%. And considering that few users are affected by this bug, slowing down method calling to such a degree is not acceptable. I tried a couple of different approaches to speed up the implementation, and ultimately I was able to get the performance difference to be small enough that even the microbenchmark did not show it as significantly slower. However, my approach was a little invasive, making multiple changes to a couple of methods that were used in the generic method dispatch code. And since this issue had already been fixed for methods defined in Ruby, and we were trying to fix it for methods defined in C, it would be nice if the changes could only be made to the dispatch code for methods defined in C. So in discussions with Koichi, I mentioned that we could switch to that approach, but it would result in more duplication. And Koichi took it upon himself to implement that non-invasive approach. And it turns out I was right about the duplication. So here's the VM call C func function before the changes. And to get the correct perspective, I'm gonna shrink the font size. And now let's see the changes. As you can see, it's quite a large increase in lines. I mean, these, these two lines in the normal case, when you're not passing a large argument splat, use the standard argument setup functions. And those two lines are replaced with expanded and customized versions in the case where you are splatting a large array. Now, there's a maintainability trade-off here. So one option is to add features to the generic functions, making the functions more complicated. And that can make the generic functions slower and make it more difficult to debug code that does not benefit from the features. On the plus side, it can make maintenance easier, especially if future code can also benefit from the features being added to the generic functions. So my approach chose this trade-off. Another option is to duplicate the parts of the generic functions that you need and modify them for a specific use case. This can result in faster code and it localizes the change. However, it can make maintenance more challenging if you need to make the same change in multiple places. So Koichi's approach chose this trade-off. Now Koichi's post patch was merged back in January, ensuring that the second oldest bug will be fixed in Ruby 3.3. At least that's what I thought when I started working on this presentation. Turns out this bug is not a single bug, but a general class of bugs. And my initial patch and Koichi's committed patch only fixed a single instance of this class of bugs. So this bug was not fixed, or at least not completely fixed. 
So I'm going to go over some code that still raised a system stack error even after the patch was committed. I mentioned earlier that Koichi made changes in Ruby 2.2 to allow this code to work. However, if you replace the normal singleton method definition with the equivalent define singleton method call, it raised a system stack error. And to understand why normal Ruby method definition works, but the block-based approach failed, you need to understand that Ruby has multiple method types, each of which is handled differently internally. Ruby has a C function named VM call method each type, which handles all of the different method types that Ruby supports. And a simplified version of that function is shown here. This function uses a C switch statement on the type of the method, similar to a Ruby case expression. Normal Ruby methods defined with def use the isec method type, isec for instruction sequence. Logic specific to calling isec methods is in VM call isec setup. And this is the code path that Koichi fixed in Ruby 2.2 to allow methods to accept large argument splats. Ruby methods defined with C functions or by C functions use the C funct method type. And logic specific to calling C funct methods is in VM call C funct. And this is the code patch that was code path that was fixed by my original patch and Koichi's patch. Ruby methods defined with define method or define singleton method use the B method type. And I think B method is short for block method because these are methods defined by blocks. Logic specific to calling B methods is in VM call B method. And this is one code path that had not been fixed, which is why calling a B method with a large argument splat raised system stack error even after Koichi's patch was merged. Unrelated to the current bug, but useful to know is that Ruby uses a call cache to improve performance. So the first time you call a method, the call cache directs you to the slower generic method dispatch functions. However, once Ruby figures out a more specific method handler, it updates the call cache so that future method calls at the same call site can jump directly to the more specific method handler. Going back to the VM call B method function, we need to determine why it fails. So here's the definition of the VM call B method function. And there was one similarity here with the VM call C funct function before we fixed the bug for C funct methods. And that similarity is in the use of the caller setup arg function. If you look back at the backtrace for the stack overflow for C funct methods, we see that the stack overflow happens during a call to the caller setup arg function. Turns out all callers of this function are vulnerable to this issue. And in Ruby 3.2, all method types other than isec use caller setup arg, which is why they were all vulnerable to this issue. Mentioned earlier, earlier that my initial patch to fix this issue made the generic argument setup code more complicated, while Koichi's patch was less invasive because it only modified the logic for C funk methods. Now the duplication approach may be preferable when you only have a problem in a specific case. However, because all usage of caller setup arg is vulnerable to this issue, the duplication approach is not maintainable. The only maintainable approach that fixes this issue in all cases requires complicating the generic code. So here's the initial code I discussed earlier to avoid the system stack error. Now, between when I originally submitted my pull request and when I started working on this presentation and found these additional bugs, Koichi had modified their related code to significantly improve performance. So I had to make some changes to my original patch to adjust for Koichi's changes. And one of the changes is at the point that this function is called, the splatted array has already been removed from the VM stack. And another of the changes is that any keyword splat is passed as a separate argument and not as the last element of the splatted array. Instead of RB array new kappa and RB object hide functions, I found that there was an RB array hidden new function that combined those two features. So I switched to calling that. And the capacity of the array is set to the number of arguments before the splat plus the number of arguments in the splatted array plus one extra for a possible keyword hash. The other important change is that I switched to storing a pointer to the temporary array in the calling structure. This is instead of only storing the pointer on the C stack or the, on the VM stack. And this was mostly for simplicity so I could easily reference the temporary array later. If we go back to the VM call B method function, we can modify it to use this new approach. 
here are the changes needed. The first change is the addition of an argument to caller setup arg for whether it is safe to use a temporary array for arguments. Now in this case, it is. If there was a temporary array created to handle a large argument splat, then we get a pointer to the first element in that array. This is instead of allocating space on the C stack and copying the arguments from the VM stack over to the C stack. We need to decrement the stack pointer by two since the array is considered a single argument. And this is to match the stack pointer adjustment in the normal case. Failure to adjust the stack pointer correctly results in SPBP mismatch errors or failing CFP consistency checks, both of which are time consuming to debug. Ask me how I know. Unfortunately, this fix, this change did not fix this issue for B methods. That's because we have a similar issue later in the VM. Three nested function calls after calling VM call B method body. The VM calls a function named invoke isec block from C, which also copies all arguments to the VM stack. First raising a system stack error if copying the arguments would overflow the stack. If you remember a few slides ago, the code that called this function copied the arguments from the VM stack to the C stack. And this copies the exact same arguments from the C stack back to the VM stack. And this unnecessary copying is one of the reasons that B method calling is slower than calling normal Ruby methods. I worked around this issue by using the same approach I used in the caller setup arg code by creating a temporary hidden Ruby array to store the arguments. If the number of arguments provided is over the limit, we call a newly added VM argv Ruby array function to create a temporary Ruby array, copy the arguments from argv into it, and return a pointer to the Ruby array. We actually always pass an array of two arguments in this case. The first argument is the temporary array, and the second argument is always a keyword hash. If keyword splat is true, that means the last argument in argv is keyword arguments. So it's removed from the array, and it's put as the keyword hash. If keyword splat is false, we add an empty hash for keyword arguments. This is so Ruby will not treat a flagged keyword hash passed as a regular argument as a keyword splat. With those changes, you can now call methods defined with define method or define singleton method with large array splats. However, this was not the only case that previously failed. There were other cases that failed as well. While splatting a large array, started working with normal Ruby method definition in Ruby 2.2. If you called the same method using send, you got a system stack error. If you use symbol to proc and call the resulting proc with a large array splat, got a system stack error. If you created a method object for the method and you called that with a large array splat, system stack error. If you defined method missing and you called a method that did not exist with a large array splat, you got a system stack error. Additionally, passing a large number of arguments in a C extension using RB yield block also resulted in a system stack error. And those were the most important cases that needed to be handled where it could be useful to pass a large number of arguments in a splat. There were also some cases where the method type only accepts zero or one argument where passing a large array splat raised system stack error instead of argument error. So if you go back to normal Ruby method definition and you change this argument splat to a regular argument when calling the method with a large array splat, it would be best to have an argument error raised, but Ruby would raise a system stack error in that case. Similarly, if you have a class that uses at your reader, calling the method defined with a large array splat raises system stack error instead of argument error. Same issue is true of at your writer. If you create a struct class, calling a member reader method for an instance of the struct with a large array splat raises a system stack error instead of an argument error. And the same issue is true of the member setter method. So squashing this bug, both for methods that could accept a large number of arguments and to get the correct exception raised for method types that only accept zero or one argument took quite a long time. And one reason for this is that this issue is not a single bug, but a general class of related bugs. Another issue is that fixing these bugs turned into a game of bug whack-a-mole, where you'd fix a single instance of this bug and that would break other test cases. And you'd fix those cases and just something else would pop up and break. One thing to be aware of is that almost no code in Ruby's test suite passes a large array splat. 
So running the test suites that come with Ruby would be unlikely to catch issues with the changes I was making. To get a higher level of confidence that the bug fixes were actually working, I did most of my debugging by deforcing temporary array usage for all method calls with splats, instead of the default behavior of only creating a temporary array for splats of large arrays. Eventually, I was able to get the entire test suite passing, fixing all cases I was aware of for passing a large array raised system stack error. However, just because all bugs have been fixed does not necessarily mean that the fixes should be committed. When deciding whether to commit anything, you need to have an understanding of the costs and benefits of committing, and you should feel that the benefits are worth the costs. Now in this case, the benefit is you can splat an array when calling it any Ruby method, and you should get the expected behavior regardless of the size of the array. Now I think that's a significant benefit, but the actual need to pass a large array splat is rare, and it's almost always better to structure code to pass a large array as a normal argument instead of splatting the array. Additionally, as I showed earlier in the presentation, if you don't fix this issue, it will be possible to remotely trigger a system stack error in some Ruby web applications. Now there are significant costs associated with the fixes. For one, the fixes are invasive, much more so than my initial attempt to fix this issue just for cfunc methods. And for another, there is a minor slowdown associated with this change. With all of the work to improve Ruby's performance, committing this patch can feel like a step backwards. One reason is that the slowdown, for the, for, reason for the slowdown is the extra checks that were added. For every call to a method that's not written in Ruby, there are extra checks for whether a temporary array is used, even if the method call did not use a splat, in some cases. Now the code to handle arguments in temporary arrays also bloats the code, and this can result in additional instruction cache misses because less of Ruby's code may fit in the processor's instruction cache. I thought it would be unlikely that committers would accept the minor slowdown to fix these corner cases. And thankfully, during my work on fixing these bugs, I learned a lot about Ruby's internals. And with what I learned, I developed a series of patching to optimize method calling in certain cases. And my goal with this series of patches was to offset the minor slowdown that was introduced by the bug fixes. One of the optimizations was to B method calling. So here's the code for VM call B method again. One thing to notice is that this function always calls caller setup arg. And the reason it does this is so it can flatten the arguments into a C array and pass a pointer to the first argument to VM call B method body. I determined that this call to caller setup arg is not actually needed in the common case where the block for the B method is defined in Ruby. However, it is needed in other cases where the block for the B method is defined in C or was created by symbol to proc. So I decided to split B method call handling into two paths, one to handle the case where the block was defined in Ruby and another for other blocks. All of this code is necessary to determine whether the block is defined in Ruby. And if the block is defined in Ruby, we call an optimized function that does not need to use caller setup arg. If the block was not defined in Ruby, we call another function that does use caller setup arg, which is similar to the previous implementation. In either case, before calling the function, we update the call cache. And the reason we update the call cache is so that future calls at the same call site can jump directly to the optimized function and skip all of this code. So I added some benchmarks and found that these changes improved B method calling by 40% in simple cases and up to 180% in keyword cases. Another of the optimizations was to method missing calls. Here is the top of VM call method missing body before the bug fix and the optimization. I determined that the caller setup arg function call here is completely unnecessary. As method missing calls do not modify existing arguments, they only insert an argument before those arguments. So the call to caller setup arg can be removed completely. However, you do need to fix the calling flags. So the calling flags include information about whether the call includes an argument splat or keyword arguments. Since caller setup arg was used previously, new calling flags were created. However, when removing the caller setup arg function call, you can just copy the calling flags 
from the original method call that resulted in the method missing, and that fixes the issue. So that simple change improved method missing calls by 10% for simple calls, and up to 110% for calls involving keyword arguments. Made a similar change to symbol procs, which are procs created by symbol to proc. That improved performance 5% for simple calls, and up to 100% for keyword argument calls. I also made a similar change for method calls using send, which improved performance 5% for simple calls, and up to 115% for keyword argument calls. To see the overall effect of the bug fixes combined with the performance optimizations, I used YJITBench. Now, YJITBench was developed by Shopify to test YJIT performance, but it's actually useful as a set of general benchmarks. It contains 33 separate benchmarks, and results showed that performance was about the same in 12 of the benchmarks. Eight of the benchmarks got slower in spite of the optimizations, up to 3% slower in the worst case. However, 13 benchmarks got faster, up to 10% faster, because the performance increase from the optimizations was higher than the performance decrease from the bug fixes. So after finishing those method calling optimizations, I brought this issue up as a topic back in April during the monthly developer meeting. And that way other committers could provide feedback and Matts could decide whether the benefits were worth the costs. And there was some concern over the performance and invasiveness of the changes. However, I ultimately received approval to merge the changes. Now there was one remaining issue. I mentioned earlier that I fixed all the bugs I was aware of in the code. Should be a caveat added. In truth, I fixed all bugs I was aware of in the virtual machine. Turns out that YJIT did not support the change I was making. The YJIT tests on ARM64 generally failed with occasional failures on AMD64. So I discussed the issues with the YJIT team, and thankfully, they were able to fix the YJIT issues. And after the YJIT issues were fixed in one last round of testing, I was able to merge the changes, ensuring that the second oldest bug in all of its incarnations will finally be fixed in Ruby 3.3. At least, that's the current plan. <laughs> the fix has been merged. There is a possibility it will be reverted in the future if the additional complexity becomes too problematic to maintain or if it starts becoming a larger performance burden as Ruby itself becomes faster. Now here are the lessons I learned from my experience fixing these bugs. First, just because a bug is old does not mean it cannot be fixed. Splatting a large array in a method call has been a problem since Ruby supported splatting arrays and this issue was known for over a decade before I started to work on fixing it. In general, it just takes one person with the determination to fix the bug. Second, fixing an old bug is often a learning process that teaches you useful things that you probably would not have learned otherwise. Without the experience I gained from fixing these bugs, I would not have been able to implement the performance optimizations that I discussed. Finally, don't worry if you can't fix a Ruby bug completely by yourself. As this issue showed, other committers will likely be available to help you improve your bug fixes so they can be committed. Ruby currently has over 50 open bugs in the bug tracker that are over five years old, just waiting for you to fix. We look forward to your contributions. I hope you had fun learning about Ruby's second oldest bug and how we fixed it in Ruby 3.3. If you enjoyed this presentation and want to read more of my thoughts on Ruby programming, please consider picking up a copy of Polished Ruby Programming. And that concludes my presentation. I'd like to thank all of you for listening to me. <laughs>